Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Jeffrey Kuvin uh, to join us this morning. Uh, in a moment, Dr. Kuvin will be giving us uh, his lecture entitled Redefining Cardiovascular Education and Competence. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to have Jeff with us this morning. Uh, as a program director, I've sort of followed Dr. Kuvin's um, contributions to education and cardiovascular education. Uh, so Dr. Kuvin is the uh, Lorinda and Vincent de Roulet Professor of Medicine and Chair of Cardiology at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. He's Chair of Cardiology at North Shore University Hospital and Long Island Jewish Medical Center. He's Co-Director of the Sandra Atlas Bass Heart Hospital at North Shore University Hospital and Senior President of Cardiology at Northwell. Dr. Kuvin was recruited to Northwell in 2020 after serving as Chief a section chief of cardiovascular medicine at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And um, prior to Dartmouth, Dr. Kuvin spent the bulk of his career serving as in progressive roles at Tufts Medical Center and Tufts School of Medicine in Boston. And there, he, his roles included uh, associate chief medical officer for graduate medical education, associate chief of cardiology, director of cardiovascular quality, and director of cardiovascular education and fellowship training. Dr. Kuvin is well known for contributions in cardiovascular education and training. He was selected to the Giesel Academy of Master Educators at Dartmouth Giesel School of Medicine and was given a career award for teaching at Tufts. He's been listed numerous times as one of Boston uh, Magazine's top physicians. Dr. Kuvin is an active member of the American College of Cardiology. He was chair of the ACC annual scientific sessions and was chair of the Lifelong Learning Oversight Committee which uh, oversaw ACC's educational offerings. Dr. Kuvin was the lead developer and first chair of the ACC in training exam and is the past editor of ACC's general cardiology self-assessment program. Dr. Kuvin is presently an associate editor for the Journal of the American College of Cardiology and is a member of the ACC's board of trustees. Dr. Kuvin is also chair of the International Advisory Committee of the Kuvin Center for the Study of Infectious and Tropical Diseases at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, this committee helps further the Kuvin Center's mission of advancing research in infectious and tropical diseases to promote peace through collaborative science. Dr. Kuvin holds a bachelor's degree in Near East and North African Studies from the University of Michigan, where he was actually a member of the swimming team um, and the swimming uh, silver medalist in the 1985 World Maccabeth Games. Uh, he earned his medical degree from Emory, completed his medicine residency and chief medicine residency and cardiology fellowships at Tufts Medical Center. Um, with uh, almost no further ado, um, I want to welcome Dr. Kuvin. Uh, just before his lecture begins, I want to uh, highlight how we can interact with the audience. Uh, we would love this uh, this program to have some questions and interaction. The two best ways to do that, you can join by web to send questions. You go to pollev.com, uh, enter Debakey, and, and then respond in that way. Send your questions or comments. Uh, or you can join by text. You text Debakey uh, to 37607 and send your message that way. Uh, at the end of Dr. Kubin's lecture, we'll look for those questions and we'll have a few minutes to respond to each, hopefully. So, Jeff, uh, thank you for coming to Houston. Thank you for joining us at Houston Methodist, and we all look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Steve. It's really, really a pleasure to be here. And again, I want to thank you and one of my premier mentors, Dr. Zogby, for the invitation. It's been great so far to be here uh, at your hospital. So just a brief moment to tell you a little bit about where I come from, uh, and right now it's from New York. Uh, Northwell Health. Northwell Health is the largest healthcare provider in the state of New York, in fact, in the region. We have 23 hospitals in our system, one quaternary care hospital, that's North Shore University Hospital, and four tertiary care centers. We have over 250 cardiologists and 25 heart surgeons on our team. Altogether, Northwell Health takes care of about 24% of the state's population with heart disease. Just a little bit by the numbers, we have 29 cath labs, 19 EP labs. You can see our annual volumes in the center. We're a busy program. We also do advanced uh, procedures such as heart and lung transplant, MCS. We have an ECMO to go program, and we're very involved in developing newer and niche programs. So anytime you're up in the New York area, please come visit. Um, uh, we're, we're happy to uh, bring you there and show you around. So the learning objectives for today's talk defined as redefining cardiovascular education and competence 
include first to understand the landscape of cardiovascular training and lifelong learning. As Steve said, this has been one of my missions throughout my career. To identify ways to develop and maintain competence in cardiovascular practice after you're completed, you've completed your training and to recognize opportunities to translate knowledge into action. So these are the five parts that I'd like to go through. First, what is competence? Second of all, how do we assess cardiovascular competence? The next is getting through that roadblock called the cardiovascular certification examination. Importantly, what is lifelong learning all about and how do we maintain our competency? And finally, what is the future of competency evaluation? So let's start with what exactly is competence? So I'd just like to read this cartoon for you. Well, you see, I went to one of those progressive medical schools with no formal classes, no credits, and the students planned their own course of study, so I never learned anything about the lungs, breathing, and all that. Well, obviously, we didn't go to these medical schools, but how do we actually assess competency? Well, this is the traditional way that we assess competency. We go through a series of um, examinations. We go through a series of schools and training paradigms to the tune of around 16 or so years um, after high school. That's a long time. And then the question is really, are we competent? And if we are, what are we competent in? But at the end of the day, when you complete your training, this is who you are. You're a doctor, and we, the public, are supposed to trust our doctors. The question then is, is your provider competent? Are you competent to do what you say you're going to do? And are you maintaining your competency as you go beyond your training years, year after year, decade after decade? Why do we care? Who cares? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious, but there are a lot of people who really care about this. Who indeed cares about your provider being competent? Well, your hospital, your employer cares. They want to make sure that you're providing the right level of care. Obviously, the public and your patients care if you're competent. And then, of course, state and local boards care. And it turns out that provider competence is linked to patient outcomes. So there's a direct link. How good the doctor is and how well the doctor keeps up or the provider uh, doesn't have to be a doctor typically leads to the right outcomes. So the traditional ways of assessing competency have traditionally been our favorite, the multiple choice question examination. Is that a good test of competency? Second of all is, well, if you have gray hair, if you've done enough, then you're probably competent, right? Third way of assessing competence is I've done a procedure, I've done 10, I've done 100, I've done 1,000, I've done a million procedures, therefore my competency level must continue to be getting larger and larger. And finally, if I'm able to see one and do one and teach one, well, therefore I am competent. And I would argue that these are indeed assessments of competency, but probably not the holy grail for assessment of competency time and time again. What is competence? Well, this dates back to Miller's Pyramid of Clinical Competence definition back in the early 1990s, where Miller described competence as, first of all, understanding and knowing the material. So reading, understanding exactly what you're supposed to do and know, and gather the facts. Importantly, you go from knowing to then know how to do it, how to interpret the data, how to apply the data, then show, this is the idea of see one, do one, teach one. And then finally, importantly, for our practice of cardiology, how we integrate it into practice, along with the proper attitudes, skills, and knowledge that come with competence. And remember, competence is not necessarily mean you're an expert. It means you're competent. It means you know how to integrate a certain amount of information into practice. I would say competence is the floor, and we have a ways to go up towards the ceiling. Now, the a ACGME, the ABMS, every training program, every program in the country, and if not the world now, defines competency a little bit different based on these six competencies that you all know and have been evaluated on for years now. They include the traditional competencies of what you know and how you integrate it into patient care. But importantly, there are four other competencies, practice-based learning and improvement, systems-based practice, professionalism, and interpersonal and communication skills, which are equally, if not more important, than the traditional two competencies of net medical knowledge and patient care. We call these other four the non-clinical competencies, but I would argue they are of equal importance uh, to all six competencies. 
So that's a gross definition of competence, what competence means in the world of cardiovascular medicine. So how do we assess competency? First, in our trainees. And a lot of this will be directed to the trainees, and they know it probably better than anybody. But first of all, as Steve and, and all of us program directors know, the training paradigm in cardiology is continuing to expand. What we went through, what I went through 25 years ago, is a mere small image of what it actually is today. You can get trained in non-invasive imaging in the following areas, heart failure, critical care, imaging, congenital heart disease, prevention, and then within imaging, you have four, four plus modalities. The world of interventional cardiology has continued to grow now with structural programs and peripheral programs, and of course, uh, an ever-increasing breadth of, and depth of knowledge in electrophysiology. And then all these other areas within cardiology and cardiovascular medicine have just exploded. And not, only, not, all, not all of them are mentioned here, but it's incredible what our, we're asking our fellows to experience, to learn, and then yes, to be competent in. And the question comes up after three or four or however many years of cardiovascular training, is a fellow considered competent in everything because they've gone through the rigors of a training program? Are fellows competent only when they pass certification examinations, of which we have five or six? Is it possible to be competent in multiple areas within cardiovascular medicine? How long does one's competency last? We think about it in 10-year increments, but is that the right thing to do? And should competency be reassessed and reassessed over time? These are some of the issues, and I'm not so sure any of us have the answers, but that we think about during and at the completion of training. This is the present paradigm of assessing competency in our cardiovascular trainees. In addition to making sure that you fulfill the requirements of the state with licensure and certification, we have other tools now that help us evaluate cardiovascular fellows as they go through the years of training. Again, these are based on the six competencies you can see in the wheel here, and they also involve other organizations, such as the ACGME, the American College of Cardiology with the curricular milestones, which I'll explain in a bit more, our core cardiovascular training statements, which are put out every five or six years as a way to standardize training across the spectrum of cardiovascular programs. And also, obviously, locally, we evaluate fellows, we ask our patients to evaluate fellows, fellows evaluate other fellows, we directly observe with simulation and 360s. Most recently, in the past seven or so years, we've implemented another assessment of competency during cardiovascular training, and that is the in-training examination. The concept of this was in other areas of medicine, in internal medicine and throughout uh, most training paradigms, there is an examination which allows program directors and trainees to know where they are on the spectrum of medical knowledge and then reassess, identify knowledge gaps, and move on from there, and sometimes, it, it, sometimes if necessary, remediate. So at the American College of Cardiology, I was fortunate to develop and be the first chair of the in-training examination about seven years ago. And we built this with the idea that ultimately, fellows are going to be asked to sit for the ABIM examination. Therefore, we should follow the same blueprint. That blueprint of content areas covered on the examination is on the left of your screen. And it's your typical areas and typical percentages of questions focusing on arrhythmias and coronary disease and the like. You can see the first couple of years of data on the right. What we have shown is that, as expected, the first year fellows in blue did the worst on the examination, while the third year fellows in yellow did the best. I think that shows good growth during a training program, as expected, but also allows trainees to know where they are amongst their peers, not only within their institution, but across the United States and beyond. Importantly, when we looked at how this examination correlates with the certification examination in cardiovascular disease, we found a nice correlation. Those fellows who did well enough on the in-training examination were much more likely to pass the ABIM certification examination than those who struggled during the in-training examination. So for the fellows out there, I would take the ITE exam scores seriously, brush up on the areas as you get feedback on the areas that you missed, and you should do just fine on the cardiovascular certification examination. But now this allows some quantitative measures and metrics that fellows and program directors can use over time. 
it's not a perfect uh, example of assessment of competency, but it's one more tool that can be added to the tool chest in addition to all the other metrics that I've mentioned. Now, the core cardiovascular training statements called COCATs, I think really have become instrumental to standardize and level set programs around the country. It used to be basically whatever a program wanted to do in training they could do as long as the local environment supported it. But now we live in a different environment where we expect our fellows across the board to have similar experiences and to make sure that, again, they are competent in the areas that are deemed important. This is the ACC 2015, the most recent guidelines that most program directors use and set their curriculums towards. Um, the most recent version of this really emphasized longitudinal care, transitions of care, chronic disease management, professionalism in the non-clinical competencies as well. They brought in new areas of cardiology, including critical care cardiology, multimodality imaging cardiology, and redefined what research and academics really meant, and broadened the definition and the scope of what it meant to be an academic cardiology fellow, and I think that was a good thing. Level three training and beyond was typically deferred for post three-year cardiology fellowship trainings, and importantly, the COCAT statement now aligns with the in-training examination. Obviously, we're due for an update on this, but I think that this was a great move forward in terms of level setting, standardizing programs around the country. In COCATs, we still adhere to the older concept that it does depend a little bit on how much time you spend in a particular area, how many procedures you do in a particular area to set the level of competency. I think you're going to see less and less of this as we move forward, but still, it is still in our 2015 version of COCATS. But importantly, we're moving beyond that. And I want to stress that competency really needs assessment across the board, and we need our own cardiologists to set aside levels of competency. What actually does it mean to be competent? So within COCATS for the first time, you will see what are called core competencies. As shown here, this is the medical knowledge core competency in fellows training in echocardiography. There's, these are from Jack in 2015. They state that in the first year, fellows need to know a certain amount of information in echocardiography. Obviously, in the second year, after 24 months, they need to know a lot more. And in the third year, even more. If you do additional years in training, you're expected to have levels of competency that are higher than previous years. In this example, for example, knowing the findings of complex postoperative adult congenital heart disease really reserved for those fellows who are spending extra time in this domain. Patient and procedural skills, the same thing. First year, you're expected to know a lot, but not necessarily be able to do much in terms of echo. But the second and the end of the third year, you're expected across the board, no matter what program you're in, to have a level of competency across the board. And of course, the non-clinical competencies of system-based practice, practice-based learning, professionalism, and communication, all core to the levels of competency as you go through the program. So again, the first time that these specific goals in very specific detail in every domain of cardiovascular medicine training have been defined in COCATS. We also have, as most recently as 2019, advanced training statements in every domain this is the example in echocardiography. I'm sure Steve knows this very well. Again, what cardiology fellows and advanced fellows are expected to know after three years, and if they do additional training years, what's expected in each of the six domains to label a fellow as competent. Now, it's not just the in-training examination and the competency statements put forth by the ACGME that dictate competence as fellows go through the program. The program directors themselves, the faculty, all develop a clinical competency committee and assess competency on a monthly and semi-annual basis. We have our COCATS guidelines. The ABIM is involved in assessment of competency during and after training. Your hospital is obviously vested in GME across the board and so on. And all of these are reported up to the level of the ACC and ultimately up to the ACGME. Now, why is this important? It's important to think about competency, again, not just based on the numbers of procedures or the number of months done in a fellowship training program, 
because we're not all the same in terms of our learning capabilities and in terms of how quickly we pick up skill sets. This is a simple slide showing confidence level on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And obviously, many people will fall into your average learner. That on average, after three years, you're going to be competent in most areas within cardiovascular medicine. But obviously, the, the paradigm of learning is different in everybody. So there are fast learners, and perhaps we should short track those. There are slow learners, and perhaps they need to have prolongation of their training. And there are some that, unfortunately, may not ever get to the level that we think are competent. And what should we do then? Should we further remediate or possibly remove trainees from the program? And these are hard decisions, and they also have uh, uh, an impact on our workforce and how we move through all of these training programs. This is now just beginning to hit our medical literature. This is a more recent uh, example from Jack, looking at competency-based education in the cardiovascular era. Um, on the right, you can see um, identif identification of thresholds for time and numbers of nuclear procedures when fellows are reading uh, with an attending uh, nuclear cardiologist to see how their reads are consistent or not. And it does look like time and numbers do have an impact, but there's probably much more into it than that. So the assessment of competency in training is indeed multifactorial. Nothing in my mind beats direct observation of trainees, getting a multitude and multi-source feedback. Using simulation is very helpful in assessing skill sets. We also have the EHR to look and see how you're identifying your competency through the written record and the digital uh, record. Clinical evaluation examinations are part of it and looking to see how fellows improve their quality over time. It's not unique uh, that we're focusing on competency assessment in graduate medical education. The undergraduate medical ed education world is also thinking about this paradigm of time versus competency assessment. And there are some that are actually short-tracking medical students from four years to shorter times and vice versa, recognizing the need for remediation and prolonging undergraduate medical education. We've done this in the graduate medical education world as well. We've piloted some uh, programs to shorten internal medicine, to have a hybrid year as a third year, to move into general cardiology earlier. Um, this works. You can assess competency. You can deem somebody competent earlier if they have the right skill set and the right mentorship. Again, the problem is how does this interplay with our friends in internal medicine and the whole paradigm of what GME provides for inpatient and outpatient general care? Most recently, I think uh, we were pushed to the brink to not look at time-based metrics of competency or even numbers of procedures and to put fellows and other trainees into uh, the limelight and into critical care settings during COVID. And as long as the cl Clinical Competency Committee and the program leadership felt that the fellows were appropriate to use their skill sets, they did. But I think this pushed the envelope a little bit and made us recognize that, again, it's the assessment of competency, not the scoring on one examination or other numeric metrics that can help us understand how to assess trainees during during the, uh, the training period. So that's the global assessment of how we look at trainees during their training program, uh, some of the summative and formative assessments of competency as you move through your training program. Obviously then, one hits the certification examination. And this truly is the entrance into, or the, I should say the exit from training and the entrance into being a cardiologist. And at this point, most cardiologists need to pass this examination to then move on for hospital and privileges elsewhere. Now, it's important to note what the ABIM is and what it's not. The ABIM administers the certification process, but does not confer the privilege to practice medicine. That's based on your hospital and your state. But in the certification process, the ABIM assesses your, prof your professional credentials. They want to make sure that you've gone through the rigors of, a, an, of a, an appropriate pr tr training program, in a, including clinical competency. And then, of course, they conduct examinations. To sit for the cardiovascular examination, as you know, you need to be certified in internal medicine. And they also have subspecialty examinations in EP, interventional cardiology, heart failure, and adult congenital heart disease. And to sit for those, you have to have passed not only internal medicine, 
but also cardiovascular disease. Examinations don't end with the ABIM. There are society examinations as well. But for the purposes of this, we'll only, we'll only focus on the ABIM. Now, the ABIM blueprint is just like I showed you for the in-training examination with the percent of examination questions on the right. And they cover the span of cardiology meant for general cardiologists to be examined. Four questions, four, sorry, four sections of multiple choice questions, each with 60 questions, allowing two minutes per question. And then as you all recall, there's an imaging section which involves both still, live, as well as EKG images. Now if you look across the board over the last five or so years, and these were taken from the ABIM website just last week, the certification examinations for internal medicine, cardiology, and its subspecialties uh, confer about a 90% pass rate for first-time takers, the lowest being for the general cardiology examination at 86% this past uh, year, but in general, high 80s, low 90s. So for first-time uh, test takers, the chances are quite good having gone through a rigorous training program and sitting the, for the first time, quite good that you're going to pass the examination. And again, go back to the in-training examination to see where you lie and where your knowledge gaps exist. So again, that's, that's the basics of it. You need to go through the training program. You need to pass the certification examination. But I, what I'd like to spend the bulk of the rest of the time on is what do we do thereafter? How do we maintain our level of competency? Who assesses it? And how do we accumulate knowledge in a lifelong learning environment? So this is the paradigm that uh, we have, at least in cardiovascular medicine at this point. We go through the years of medical school, internal medicine training, cardiovascular training, and the like, sit for the examination. But the bulk of our careers are going to be as a lifelong learner and how we're going to be assessed in, in our maintenance of certification. And who's assessing us? Well, our employers assessing us, the institutions we work at, the state, the ABIM through their MOC program, and society's help along the way. But again, the bulk of our professional careers will be in this lifelong learning category. And again, remembering that just because you completed a training program and you attained a certain level of competency doesn't necessarily you want to or you are maintaining your level of competency. Well, the ABIM obviously takes a lead role in our MOC process. And there are four parts to it, or there were four parts to it. Part one is ensuring that you have the proper licensure and professional standing to be a member of the ABIM. Second is a self-evaluation of medical knowledge. Third is the secure examination. And fourth is what was called self-evaluation of practice performance. Now, over the years, this paradigm of MOC has changed quite a bit. Before the 1990s, there was an examination, and people who were in the era of being a grandfather or grandmother in the examination didn't have to really worry thereafter. They were certified, and nothing else was going to happen, nor did they have to do anything further. But then in 1990, they felt that there was a need for continuing assessment of competency and they built the re-examination paradigm of a 10-year examination. Then the MOC, the maintenance of certification, where it was felt that not only did a 10-year examination meet the mark, but you needed to show continuous education in addition to the 10-year examination. And then in 2014, they added that board certification is passing the initial examination. Maintenance of certification is actually a designation. So a lot of changes over the past 20 or so years, focusing not only on one re-examination, but the continuous efforts needed to maintain your certification. So getting to the 10-year examination, this is still in play. Uh, and these, again, are the same data for the 10-year examination that I showed you for the first time take test takers for the initial certification examination. So for the 10-year recertification examination, again, the scores are pretty high typically above 90%, um, perhaps in interventional cardiology, a little bit on the lower side at 86%, but a pretty good chance that you're going to pass the 10-year recertification examination if you choose to take it. Now, what's always come into question is, does this maintenance of certification process, does it matter? Should we be doing this? Should we be like pilots where every 
couple of months, every year, as we're reassessed in either formative or summative fashions. And I think the debate still continues. The American Board of Internal Medicine believes that MOC matters, suggesting that MOC re results in decreased disciplinary actions, improved performance, whether it's getting appropriate care or adhering to guidelines, and perhaps some hard endpoints like um, making sure that patients get to proper LDLs, et cetera. I would argue that some of the data uh, is not convincing as of yet uh, on the published outcomes of our cardiovascular metrics, but probably more to come. How much MOC is actually needed to make sure that we are maintaining competency? Importantly, where does this hit our scope of practice? Do we need to know everything in cardiovascular medicine, or should we really be focusing on what our scope of practice is and assessing and maintaining competency in those areas? What's the right format to assess competency in lifelong learners? How frequent? And of course, time and money. So as you've seen in the lay and the medical literature, there's been uh, an onslaught of discussion about the appropriateness of the way the metrics are set at this point for MOC, for lifelong learning assessment of competency. And even the ABIM got into it and said, you know, we're, we're wrong, we, we got it wrong, we're sorry, we're gonna change the way we do it. But pick up any journal uh, or any lay periodical these days you're gonna, and you're gonna see a lot of information about different ideas about how we should move forward with MOC. So in 2016, the ABIM did change the paradigm. So they did some things that I think moved the needle in the right direction. That part four of practice assessment to show in your own practice that you are changing in focusing on patient safety and the patient voice, they put the, those requirements on hold. That just became too much of a burden for practicing cardiologists to do. Next, the diplomat's MOC status on the web page changed from meeting maintenance of certification requirements to participating. Since this was an ongoing process, as long as you were participating in the process, they put you in that category. Importantly, they reversed what was called double jeopardy. You no longer needed to maintain your general cardiology boards to keep up your specialty boards. In addition, you didn't have to maintain the internal medicine boards to keep up cardiology. You didn't need to maintain cardiology to keep up heart failure, EP, interventional, or congenital heart disease. And they also decoupled the initial board exam from MOC participation. So you wouldn't lose your initial certification if you didn't want to continue in the MOC process. But they did say that you have to prove that you are participating in a yearly or every other year fashion by showing that you are accumulating points enough over five years and you needed to sit again for the secure 10-year examination. This was in 2016. In 2019, the ACC, really through its membership committee, decided to take a different route and to provide members with an alternative to the 10-year examination. So instead of sitting every 10 years for a secure examination put forth by the ABIM, the idea was that there would be ongoing yearly education with learning modules as well as assessment tools that would follow a certain path the questions written by cardiologists within the American Col Car Col College of Cardiology, but in conjunction and getting credit with the American Board of Internal Medicine. So this, since 2019, has been available to our cardiologists. This is called the Collaborative Maintenance Pathway, or CMP. And it's really built on the model of the long-known um, uh, 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 utility of ACC SAPs, the self-assessment products, which are um, knowledge-based uh, modules that have assessment tools in them. So again, this is partnership with the American Board of Internal Medicine and the ACC. It's, it couples learning with assessment, using the self-assessment products and practice questions, and at the end, each year you take 60 questions for MOC credit. This takes you out of the paradigm of needing the 10-year examination. Each year, a subject is focused upon. So in 2019, it was arrhythmias, 2020, cardiac coronary artery disease, 2021, heart failure, and the like. There's been a little bit of a delay due to COVID, so this year it's actually heart failure. But again, the idea is that you can do this from home, you can learn, 
you can use practice questions. Then you sit for a 60 question secure exam at your house during a specific period of time. And if you pass that, you will indeed be MOC and you won't have to sit for the 10 year examination. More recently, actually just a few months ago, the ABIM launched its own product. So they're continuing with our CMP with the American College of Cardiology, but also launched a new product called the Longitudinal Knowledge Assessment. So this takes it one step further. This is a quarterly set of secure questions, 30 of them. You have four minutes per question, and you get a couple of points with each question. You get immediate feedback if you passed or didn't pass the question. And the idea is over five years, you will accumulate about 500 questions. You will get the right number of points, 100 points over five years. They'll compute a score, decide if you've passed or not. If you didn't pass that, then you do need to go back to the 10-year examination. This is for general cardiology, not the subspecialties. And this is brand new. The idea here is that you can, again, avoid taking the 10-year examination by taking continuous smaller examinations over a five-year period. So right now, the options for maintaining your competency, at least the way we assess it now in cardiovascular medicine, is three ways. The ABIM 10-year examination, the ACC collaborative maintenance pathway with the ABIM, or the ABIM's new product called the Longitudinal Knowledge Assessment. And you can see some of the issues um, listed here uh, in terms of who's eligible for this um, and what kind of um, questions, et cetera, are offered. So this is where we are now, and I, I would argue that this is really where we are now. Uh, we have now different ways to assess competency. No one really knows exactly what they want to do, what the best way to use their time and money and resources for, and is this really appropriate for their scope of practice, and who really cares? In addition, while we have these MOC pathways, over the past few years, the American College of Cardiology has also done what they did for fellows in training, now for lifelong learners. And this is, again, saying, what does it mean to say you're competent in a specific area? And I think this gets to where we're heading, and that is towards your scope of practice. These are published in 2016, and they continue to be updated just like our guidelines. But in each of these domains on the right, 20 plus domains, you can identify levels of competency or what's expected for you as a provider to do to be competent in each of these six areas. Again, the two clinical and the four non-clinical competencies, it's expected that you maintain a certain level of knowledge. And what I've put up in front of you is the echo knowledge competencies and, and all six competencies for echocardiography as a lifelong learner. So we now have a blueprint. The chiefs and chairs of cardiology can look at these and say, are my echocardiographers competent in, the, in these areas? And therefore, I should feel compelled to either focus on remediation or say, you know what? Yes, indeed, you are assessing and you are uh, at the level of competence that you should be at. In addition, beyond those 20 levels uh, of competency statements that we have, we've moved beyond in terms of assessing competency for leaders and professionalism, and this is very important in today's world. And we've gone beyond the physicians as well, and there are now, as of last year, competencies set aside for nurse practitioners and physicians, physician assistants who participate in the care of cardiovascular patients. Again, a nice way to assess competency uh, in a non-punitive way, but just simply to say, is one meeting the levels of competency that we expect? So in summary, the, this is where we are in terms of our tools to establish competency in training. We have the milestones. We have the curricular competencies set forth by the ACGME. We have ACGME program requirements and our COCATS documents. And now we have an in-training examination. Of course, we sit for the formal examination after training. And then we have tools, some of which are new, to establish competency in the practice of cardiology for lifelong learners including, of course, state lic licensing and hospital credentialing, CME activities, MOC programs, and as just mentioned, the ACC lifelong learning competencies. So where do we go from here? And I would say that where we are right now is not where we should or can be in the future. 
as I stated in a recent Jack editorial published this past week, we need to move from our traditional metrics of education to a competency-based skill set for educating and assessing competency. But really the goal on the right is to have actionable education, where it's personalized, where the learner is in charge of their education. And the learner is using multiple sources of education to be educated. It's a longitudinal process. There's no start, there's no stop, there's no number of procedures to be done. It is evaluated on your performance and it's evaluated in a continuous fashion. As you can imagine, for each individual in each individual's practice area, this can get complicated and who's going to authorize competency or not. But we have AI, we have technology, we have a digital transformed practice. We need to move from traditional focuses of education towards competency and actionable levels of knowledge. So I think the future of our assessment of competency and our, and our future of educating as we move along is moving from a quantity-based to a quality-based assessment and education. We need to get out of the idea of we're maintaining certification, i.e. maintaining passing an examination, to maintaining competency in a specific area or focus of our work. We need to obviously continuously educate and continuously assess our competency. We need to focus on what is actionable knowledge at the point of care. This has to be done in a team-based environment using multiple modalities of education incorporating any kind of bit of digital transformation that we can. In order to do this, we need to make sure our faculty are trained to teach this way. And of course, we need to be rigorous in how we look at this, how we evaluate the data, and how we publish these data and, and learn from it. So with that, I'd love to entertain questions. Um, I don't have all the answers just yet. I can tell you that at the American College of Cardiology, we're working hard to the next levels of assessment of competency. We're excited about some, some potential paradigm shifts, um, but we'd love to have input from all of our members, all of our team members, not just physicians, but APPs, uh, nurses, and the like. Thanks for your attention. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Kuvan. That was fantastic. Uh, a tour de force, and you, you really covered a lot of uh, very important ground. Um, some questions, we have some questions coming in through our system, so I'll remind all to please send your questions. Uh, PollEV.com, uh, enter DeBakey, uh, submit your question or comment, uh, or by text, uh, text the word DeBakey to 37607. Um, while those are coming in, I do have a few questions, and, and as I look at them, they're sort of a reformatting of the same question several times. Um, so MOCC which is maintenance of certification confusion. <laughs> um, and your graphic did a nice job of sort of encapsulating some of the, the current challenge for practitioners. Um, two scenarios, and I want to sort of get your sense of it. So probably academic, academic center scenarios. So the electrophysiologist, been in practice for 10 years, an expert uh, in their, their domain. Um, they might feel that they've got to recertify in general cardiology potentially. Uh, which would include competency defined in echo evaluation of low flow, low gradient, severe AS. So it's in there and the, the core competency, but it's not something they're ever going to practice because they've got partners who do that. So that's the scenario, the allied scenario from slightly the other, the other side is cardiac uh, MRI expert. Very, very good at that field. That's their domain. They don't manage ACS, acute coronary syndromes at all. They've got partners who do that uh, all the time. Um, yet they might be expected to present that in a competency evaluation. So you, you mentioned very nicely about the whole concept of recognizing domains and competency within the domain, but domains have become so subspecialized even beyond the ABIM recognition of those specialties. So how does a practitioner, then I'll come back to some training questions, but how does a practitioner sort of approach that? In so yes, I, lo I love it. MOCC is exactly right. It's one big uh, mess, I would say. In terms of scope of work, I think, number one, the individual needs to define his or her scope of work. Second of all, the scope of work needs to also be defined by the program, by the group that in which the person practices. 
for things like interventional cardiology, electrophysiology, heart failure, and even adult congenital heart disease, you don't have to go through the rigors of MOC for general cardiology. You don't. You may want to, but you don't. You are going to go to the highest level, at least within the ABIM, of that area, as be assessed in the ways that, that we've talked about, either through a 10-year examination or going through some of the other tools, if you will. But it can stop there. Um, MRI is a little bit of a different story because the MRI uh, focus or advanced imaging focus has not been a focus of the American Board of Internal Medicine. Therefore, their highest level of competency has to be at the level of the ABM general certification mm -hmm. examination. So it's confusing. Nobody really knows what to do. And by the way, the other societies, MRI, ECHO, um, nuclear, CT, they've all gotten in the mix too with recertification examinations every 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if you really go by the book, one could be sitting for a recertification examination almost every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that our fellows need to understand that that may not be feasible. They may think that it's great to get all these certificate, certificates at the end of training, but that's just not feasible when you're in a busy practice, when you have all sorts of other things that you're trying to do, uh, not to mention the time and the money that goes into it. We need to streamline this. We need to redefine how we're assessing competency in the practicing world. Um, and I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, in, in the training perspective, you've mentioned very nicely, the, the paradigm has always been, probably because it's quantifiable, time equals volume equals competency. It's, it's easy math. And, and for the average learner, it might work. Um, but for those who are you know, very fast or those who, who struggle a little bit, it clearly doesn't work. Are we really gonna get away from that? I know we're, we're, we're taking steps away from it, but seems like we'll always have an element of volume-based experience as a surrogate to the evaluation of competency. I think it's got to be a combination, to be honest. Um, I think we have to set the floor at baseline levels of time, i.e. experience, and numbers of procedures, but I think there's much more to it. We've all seen people, in fact, sometimes ourselves, that we can get by with a couple of procedures, but that doesn't mean we're comfort comfortable, nor confident, nor mm -hmm. competent. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to go beyond that, and I think that's where we get into these competency statements, which help us, as the cardiology community, define what it really does mean to be competent. It's not just sticking the needle, it's actually, do you know the indications for it? Do you know how, to, how this fits into the whole practice of cardiology? So I don't think we're gonna ever totally abandon a time and a number metric, because as you said, it's easy, it's quantifiable, it's scalable, but we need to go beyond it and say, yes, you've, meet, you've met the threshold, if you will, but let's dig deeper to make sure that you indeed are competent. Excellent. Uh, thank you. We do have some questions coming in from our online audience, so we'll hit the first one, which is the lower one you may see. So first question is, does a grandfathered cardiologist need to participate in MOC? So <laughs> there aren't that many grandfathered cardiologists out there anymore. As, as I said, this was back in the 1990s when um, the whole idea was, okay, we're gonna set a new level, and therefore we can't go backwards, we can only move forwards. Um, if you want to say that you are MOCing, you are maintaining, you're participating in MOC, there is no grandfather for that. Um, so if you want to be listed by the ABIM that you are participating in the maintenance of certification, you have to participate, and that is accumulating points every couple of years, and then doing one of those three paradigms the 10 year exam, the CMP, or the new knowledge assessment. Great. Um, and I see a comment from Dr. Zogby. So uh, thank you, Dr. Zogby, for sending this question. Uh, first, with a comment, thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful and comprehensive uh, update. Do we know how practicing physicians continue their education, presumably outside of academic medical practices? And then the follow up question is how many physicians are now using MOC through ACC and others? So, how do docs like to get their, their <laughs> education? Any which way um, you can get education. I think what we're, really, what we're realizing now is the idea of sitting down with a textbook, sitting down to listen to an hour's lecture. Um, nobody has the time or energy or even concentration for that anymore. It's bits of information. We are trying to figure out ways to take competency statements or guideline documents that are hundreds of pages long and put it into bite-sized chunks, mm -hmm. things that you can use at the point of care. And I would argue we can even assess at the point of care. Are you using those statements, those guidelines effectively in your practice? Sort of a full circle loop, if you will. 
Um, right now, it's about split. About 50% of cardiologists are still sitting for the 10-year examination, and the others are participating in the newer products, the CMP, and now the, the learning, uh, the longitudinal knowledge assessment. I still think, though, if you asked the average participating cardiologist, what's the best way, or where do you see this moving, they're just not going to know. There's a lot of confusion. Um, and nobody even knows, by the way, if this is helping us, if this is helping our patients, mm. is it improving cardiac outcomes? So I think that the world, not just cardiology, by the way, the world at large is trying to reassess formative and summative evaluations. Um, pick up the New York Times, no longer is our, our many colleges even looking at SAT or ACT scores, right? That's, that's a traditional assessment of competency. They're looking beyond it. What kind of life lessons are, are students learning and how can they apply it in daily life? And maybe we should move towards that. It's hard, it's less quantifiable, but it's probably more meaningful. Yeah, the, the, uh, the holistic review is it's a bit of a black box. You don't really know what it means, but it, it, it sounds good if you, if you have the tools to do it properly. Um, I think probably the final question, given the time we have, I'll ask from maybe from the fellow's perspective. You've been a program director. You've been a luminary in medical education and, and cardiovascular education for much of your career. So what advice would you give to, uh, an, you know, say, a first-year cardiology fellow starting the journey, anticipating these challenges for decades of career, hopefully? What habits? should they begin to try to ingrain to make this easier uh, as they start the road? Uh, it's a tough question, Steve. <laughs> I think <laughs> certainly your fellows are, are blessed with amazing opportunities and experiences. Um, I think, you know, certainly going through the training program to just soak up as much as you can, but learn your style of the way you learn best. And not everybody learns the same way, not everyone picks it up in the same fashion. Again, not everyone can do something right after uh, they've done or one, one or two of these. So learn what works best for you. Try to make sure that you become competent and comfortable and confident in a number of areas, but you don't have to be competent in every single area. I think our fellows now believe when they leave training, they need to pass five or six examinations so they can be marketable and they can be competent. But the bottom line is it's hard and you wanna be really good at a few things instead of being not so great at many things. So focus your education, um, absorb as much of it as you can during training, and then uh, set aside time to meet and talk to mentors. I think people who have experienced this in the past can share their wisdom, and we've all benefited from amazing mentors, that can help you really navigate these complicated waters. And it's getting more and more complicated as fellows move towards completing fellowship and move to actually work the workforce, it's becoming a much, much more complicated environment. Mm -hmm. And how we train our fellows to do that in the non-clinical competencies, in the practice of cardiology, in the business of cardiology, I think uh, we need to continue to focus on that because that's gonna be an important and increasingly important over time. Excellent, terrific, well thank you. Um, so I think we'll, we'll end there, we're exactly on time. I wanna thank again Dr. Jeffrey Coven for for joining us today and, and giving us his presentation on redefining cardiovascular education and competence. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Steve.